It's uh, 4.03, so we'll go ahead and, and start for today's seminar. Uh, it does look like we are recording. Yeah. Yeah. That little blinking thing is recording, so good. Okay. All right, so uh, welcome to today's uh, Emmy seminar. Uh, I'm delighted here to be able to introduce our speaker today. Mr. Josh Hine is from the University of Dayton. Uh, not only is he teaching at the University of Dayton, but he is an alumnus of the University of Dayton, as am I, proud flyers. Uh, and uh, Josh did his master's degree uh, at Penn State with me in the fuel science program. Um, and then from there, went to Princeton and did his PhD in mechanical engineering uh, with uh, his thesis advisor, Fred Dreyer. So Josh worked with me on aspects of coal drive jet fuels. Uh, he worked with Fred on the topic of jet fuel surrogates, part of a large multi-university research initiative project, a big Murray project. And as I recall, in the background of that, there was the Princeton and there were Penn State and a few other collaborators as part of the team. And then that was the East Coast team, it's like rap. <laughs> and then there was a West Coast team that was Stanford and USC. And these people didn't, you know, no, they, they got along just fine. But, uh, but uh, anyway, Josh came out of that Erie program and, and also has many years of experience in jet fuel and is one of the nation's foremost experts on sustainable aviation fuel. So we're delighted to hear uh, Josh's talk today and have him here with us. So let's welcome Professor Heiner. Thank you very much. Um, it's a, uh, a pleasure and an honor uh to be speaking with you all and uh throughout the entire day and um i'll try to uh i i have a lot in the slides in terms of different topics we've worked on in SAF, and a lot of these touch points have connected with a number of faculty i've had the the pleasure of meeting with earlier today <clears throat> so why why SAF or why sustainable aviation fuel um, right now, uh, as it's no um, surprise to anyone in here, the world is rapidly looking for ways to decarbonize transportation, energy, as well as uh, minimizing the human health or the human impact on our planet. And in terms of aviation, I think we're at a very uh, interesting time. Um, there are many new technologies that are being developed at present um, to facilitate greener, more sustainable uh, transportation opportunities. And by and large, there's, there's about four competing technologies at present. Um, <clears throat> so there's electric propulsion, there's hydrogen fuel cell propulsion, and there's sustainable aviation fuel. I'm going to try and pull out the pen here. And if you look at forward in time, um, these technologies are expected to, to manifest themselves commercially over the next several decades. Um, SAF at the moment, and I'll talk about this on the next slide, uh, can be cur currently commercially used in aviation. There's specifications and several uh, pathways that are approved for usage. Um, electric and hydrogen fuel cell will come online in the next several decades. And then the final um, component or, or, or competing technology is um, hydrogen combustion, which has been um, getting a lot of uh, interest. But by and large, there's two things we want to really impact with changing the way that we travel. And that's the impact we have on, on people and the, and, and the environment. Um, so I guess I can walk away because you can see me online. I, I feel tied to this because yeah, no, you can, you can. Uh, I guess they can toggle online between yeah. the two. I guess here we can. Uh... Are there any faculty in the room that really want to continue teaching hybrid for eternity? I don't. Know. Or the other. All right. And um, so uh, SAF right now has the greatest potential long term and immediate term for uh, aviation decarbonization. 
Um, hydrogen, and it's not quite clear, hydrogen combustion, it's not clear what the impact will be on NOx and particularly contrail formation. Contrails and NOx are responsible for approximately two thirds of the uh, radio forcing from aviation. So um, we need to be very mindful of those moving forward. Uh, right now, there's a lot of interest in the US government space and sustainable aviation fuels. There's been a grand challenge uh, from the Department of Energy. An MOU has been signed by the Department of Transportation, FAA, and DOE to coordinate across these agencies to facilitate the commercialization of, of SAF. Um, the goal being by 2030 to have 3 billion gallons produced of domestic um, SAF and by 2050, 100% SAF um, uh, penetration. They've also committed uh, significant funds to R&D for aircraft and engine design. Uh, engine, uh, aircraft and operations efficiency is a major uh, opportunity to reduce emissions through efficiencies, but there's also a lot of interest <clears throat> in SAF uh, in terms of uh, facilitating um, decarbonization, developing new pathways, feedstocks, and et cetera. This is kind of, it, it's very boring, I understand from an academics perspective and, and for students, but this is really important when we talk about SAF, is that there is a process to get a SAF technology approved, and that is ASTM D4054. And there are currently approved pathways, uh, 7566 pathways. And really that most of my work over the last six years has been trying to facilitate the approval process to try to uh, decrease the amount of time and testing needed to get through approval. Historically, the approval of a SAF has taken about seven years and 70,000 gallons of neat SAF uh, consumed to be approved. And uh, that's, that's a lot of volume and a lot of time lost um, that could have been potentially used for, for commercialization or development activities. And so this is the ASTM D4054 process. Um, just to enter the process, you need about 100 gallons of fuel, and that's a very high bar for new technologies to eclipse. But there's lots of opportunities for new technologies that meet 7566 specifications. So what I spend a lot of time with is getting companies aligned for D4054 to enter it and ideally sail through it or to align current uh, companies to, to get their, uh, their pathway aligned with 7566 specifications. <clears throat> Towards the streamlining of, of D4054, uh, I had the, the honor of being the integrator and coordinator of the National Jet Fuels Combustion Program with the mission to try and reduce the amount of fuel needed for that qualification process. At its peak, it was composed of 150 researchers, 40 institutions, three countries, or six countries, three continents. And um, we were really focusing on the two most important, um, two most important uh, uh, safety concerns for aviation combustion. And that is lean blowout and ignition. So lean blowout, an aircraft is flying at altitude, maybe the pilot throttles back a little bit, and that dethrottling basically causes the flame to extinguish because the equivalence ratio is in that the right stoichiometry to burn. And then when that happens, uh, you have a flame out and the aircraft can lose power. And obviously that's not a good thing. So we don't want the 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 aircraft to ever blow out. So we want to be able to predict that uh, effect in an aircraft engine. Are you focusing on um, like commercial air, airliners? Overwhelmingly. To like uh, Department of Defense military aircraft? Yeah, so we, we work all the way down to about a quarter of an atmosphere. Um, a third of an atmosphere, I think is what we had a number of different uh, rigs uh, test at. A quarter is the highest. So in terms of altitude, I can't remember exactly what that equates to, but it's not the, you know, extraordinarily high altitude. 
And, uh, and then the other, the worst case condition, and this is the, uh, the Sully Sullenberger um, case, right, where he right. takes off from LaGuardia and bird strike, both main engines go out. It's a cold day, he's at altitude. And what does he do? He goes and he lights the APU. And an APU in an auxiliary power unit and the engine is very likely cold soaked and he needs to ignite it. So you've got a cold soaked engine, potentially a very cold fuel at altitude that's got a relight for Sully to be able to control the aircraft to steer it. And so that's altitude ignition, which is a, a very, very uh, tight needle to thread. And so we did a lot of tests on, on altitude ignition um, as well in the NGFCP. The group was, was split up into, seven working groups and within each working group, there was sometimes six or seven labs who worked to maximize the variance that an aircraft engine could see in terms of fuel properties and uh, the, the thermodynamic conditions going into the engine. Um, we, did, we, we went and looked for, this was Tim Edwards' hard work with Cliff Moses uh, many years before the NJFCP, they went and looked at identifying the best case conventional fuel, worst case conventional fuel, and an average conventional fuel. And that basically set our bounds for, you know, th when things got really bad in a, in a, um, for, a, for, a, for a candidate fuel. And our category C fuels were designed to maximize the variance that you hypothetically could see in a SAP. <clears throat> so this is just an example of the LBO working group, uh, uh, for those of you not in combustion, I understand this is a little bit uh, uh, detailed, but we had everything from very, very fund or more fundamental rigs, even had a shock tube um, in this working group in some cases, all the way to you know very applied rigs. This is an actual Honeywell APU, which was likely the same type of APU that was used in the in Sully's flight. Uh, we also had a GE full annular TAPS rig involved in the program. So we test all of these different rigs, all these different conditions with all these different fuels. And we try to see what variance of importance pops out. One of the most interesting things that came out of the NJFCP was this additional um, controlling physics at the lean blowout limit. So historically, there'd been a lot of work, um, Arthur Lefebvre, that had looked at uh, spray breakup mechanisms being the dominant. Um, bottleneck for, for SAF uh, 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 operability. And so what we did is we varied the, the pressure uh, across the dome. So basically this is how much pressure drop there is that's taking and shearing the, the uh, fuel spray and breaking it up quickly. <clears throat> so we did a really poor job intentionally, a really poor job in initially <clears throat> breaking up the spray. And it turns out that the onus surge number or spray properties, you know, density, surface tension, viscosity were really important for controlling that limit. But as we increased the, uh, the pressure drop across the nozzle, so for gas turbine, you know, this is, I'm talking about this pressure drop from this side of the, the nozzle to the other side. And in here, there's, there's a swirler that works to break up the spray and, and generate a primary recirculation zone. As we increase that pressure drop, increase the shear, increase the mixing, what pops out is the, the derived CTA number. So the CTA number is a, a measure of the propensity of a fuel to auto ignite. We did some other more fundamental studies in a, in a well stirred reactor, and we saw similar results you know, at Georgia Tech and, and even um, older work that had been done in, uh, in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. But basically, what was the, the evidence was there's a very strong connection to the stabilization <clears throat> of a aviation fuel and the drive CTA number. And this is important because current existing pathways like isododecane and X5 and 7566 have very, very low ignition delay or very low uh, CTA numbers. So as a result of the, the National Jet Fuels Combustion Program, <clears throat> there are kind of two overarching products, I guess, as a result. Number one is previous to fuels entering D4054, pre-screen them. So this is what my lab does a lot of. We've received uh, 85 samples um, from a couple dozen different labs. And we do uh, you know, analytical chemistry 
on those samples and predict the properties, or we actually measure them with as low of volumes as we can. And we call that pre-screening part tier alpha and tier beta. Once a producer gets their sample aligned for aviation uh, safety specs, we propose using another rig that only requires 100 gallons. And this isn't actually what's happening, so I don't want to give the impression that we, <clears throat> this is currently how 4054 works, but we're working towards it. And so the, the theory is that with 110 gallons, we could qualify a fuel doing all the critical tests that end up happening at this tier three and tier four, which can involve full, <clears throat> full flight tests. We don't see any reason. There is no, currently no evidence that suggests this is not the right way to work things in the future. But that is not saying that there aren't unknown unknowns that we aren't accounting for at the moment. <clears throat> We've published a book recently, uh, last year in August, that summarizes a lot of this. If you're a uh, you know, spray combustion kinetics, kinetics type person, I'm sure there's a lot in here you can find interesting. But getting back to the, to, to the pre-screen thing and some of the discussions I've had with other faculty today, this is what we call our panel plot for pre-screening. And basically, anytime we receive a new sample in the lab, we'll do a hydrocarbon type distribution, um, as well as the, uh, the major uh, fractionation of, of various types. If we can test the fuel, we'll actually do the, the property tests. There's several properties, uh, or at least one that we, we don't like measure sending to labs because <clears throat> labs have been inconsistent. We'll send the same sample to the same lab and get two different results. Um, there, there's issues with some of the ASTM tests and ASTM is aware of this. And then, so the green region here, this is a, a conventional fuel range. In this case, this is an average jet fuel composition. So if properties are in the green, that's good. If they're in the red, that's not so good. And, you know, we work with these various institutions to align their feedstock and processes to eclipse, to get in the green at the blend ratio that they want to for their for product. You mentioned the storage number there. Yeah. So you're looking at uh, like droplet dynamics breakup. And... That's right. Yeah. So how sensitive... I mean, are some of those uh, dynamics with the different fuels? Yeah, a lot of it is the, uh, the, the thermodynamics of the test conditions are really important. So, you know, temperature is a huge lever for viscosity. Um, and it's interesting, we saw some <clears throat> results where they weren't conclusive, but at like very low temperatures, viscosity drove all observed variants. And then at a certain point, um, we saw some data that suggested the surface tension was important. So we're talking going from primary breakup to secondary breakup. And then, you know, I'm kind of waving my hands a little bit, but, you know, it looks like distillation temperatures started to become important later. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some blind spots that we didn't really tap down. But for low temperatures, the most severe condition, without a doubt, viscosity is the most important. So the perspective that we have on SAP with the pre-screening and um, the analytical chemistry methods that we, we apply to them, you know, we think about SAFs as being both potentially extremely diverse in their composition and also potentially extremely selective. So they can be at both ends of the spectrum as compared to a conventional fuel. So basically takeaway here from these bottom two slides or the bottom two plots, this is a two-dimensional chromatogram and anytime you see a little space here, a light blue, that means that there isn't a, a molecule specific structural stereoisomer coming out at that gap. And this is one candidate sample that we received. And you can see that every, there's no space in that gap. <clears throat> so what that means is that basically the, the, the fuel is very diverse in terms of its, its stereo and structural isomers for isoalkanes, but at the same time, there's these two fuels, farnesane and isododecane, they're very, very selective. And there's lots of biological routes 
that we work with that similarly have this level of, of specificity. So this is a problem when you're trying to predict, when you're trying to facilitate, you know, a lab's development of a SAF technology, <clears throat> because you can't use what we call um, top-down approaches, where you take this kind of data and you take your your data that you you know I showed you before your property determinations and then statistically correlate. There's no way it's going to work. So what we really focus on developing in the lab are what we call bottom-up approaches, where we try to incorporate as much uncertainty as we can as as much as we can in the, in the model. So for example, here, this is uh, uh, the type of variance you can expect from C10 isoalkanes. So you can think about how do you arrange um, 10 carbons in a, uh, in a series without making a loop or without you know, removing some hydrogens and making an aromatic. And so again, we're comparing a conventional fuel range versus the spec limits for all these key properties. And what you can see is with C10 isoalkanes, you know, you can be in the jet fuel range or well out of it um, for all of these really important uh, properties like viscosity. You know, this would be a, I don't know what molecule this is, but that would be really bad if, if that was in your fuel. And so unless you have enough volume to test it, you know, traditional top-down approaches are not going to work. So what we do is we take this kind of um, methodology and we slap it on to, uh, or we, we take this kind of, of variance and we put it on to our, our, uh, our GC by GC VUV um, FID system. So the VUV detector that we have, I have another slide on this later. What this allows us to do is take that high level variance with C10 isoparaffins and say, no, we don't have any C10 isoparaffin. We have this specific C10 isoparaffin. And with that information, we can predict uh, much, much better the properties of the, the fuel. So um, we don't have in our database for the absorption of spectra. So this is just absorbance versus uh, wavelength for some time stamp <clears throat> for some, some analyte that's coming out of our GC by GC. And so for a lot of our different isomers, we get a match. For a lot of them, we don't. And when we don't get a match, we know what kind of hydrocarbon type it is. And we look at every possibility, uh, possible <clears throat> property. What, but why use the VUV instead of a mass spectrometer? That's a great question. <clears throat> so MS systems um, are not known to be quite as selective. I have a I have a slide on identifying. I think it's one methyl three ethyl benzene versus one methyl four ethyl benzene. And we can see the difference between them. Those two molecules may not have much variance in terms of these key properties, but you know, sometimes they make a huge difference. Okay. Secondary question, would you have any idea whether VUV would be better than mass spec if what you want to look at is isotopic variance of the same molecule? So you talk about C14 base CO2 versus C12 CO2. Would VUV have any value in trying to discriminate between Isotopes. I, I don't know, but I, I'd be happy to try. That's a great a great question. I have not seen any any I don't know of any literature that's looked at that yet. Okay. I would imagine it would have some effect, but if, if can we measure that signal? I, I don't know what, what the signal to noise ratio is. Yeah. Okay. Great question. So here's an example of something that we've uh, we've done with LHV and uh, and SAFs, um, so lower heating value is really important um, for many reasons, including the, the value that SAFs add. They have higher lower heating values typically. But right now, you know, this, this X line is, is in the spec, which is not a good thing. So let me take a little bit of a step back. This is a UNED plot. These values are our 95% confidence intervals for LHV. The stars are, if we go into our database and we say, let's take the lowest LHV possible from our entire database for each of these hydrocarbon types and add them together, we get the stars. The, uh, the Xs are a current uh, 7566 approved fuel or acute approved uh, 
spec test, which is, is not particularly strong. Um, and so, you know, we, this, for example, we're working with OEMs to get this out of the spec, <clears throat> but we're also able to, uh, to quantify pretty well the total uncertainty of our measurement, um, tracing it all the way back to isomer variants, um, the property variants. So we work with NIST. If we don't have a, a property for a specific molecule in our database, we go to NIST and say, hey, can you calculate this for us? They use ab issue calculations and provide the data. And they also provide some uncertainty. The green is the, the variance associated with our experimental method. And so we're basically developing this over and over and over again for every property we care about. This is an example of our, our ability to reduce the, the uncertainty in our predictions. So the red line is uh, with the VUV, <clears throat> blue lines represent the um, the, the variance associated if we know nothing about the stereo or, or isomeric structure. So you can see we dramatically reduce the prediction of our uh, surface tension versus a measurement. The blue is the, the blind sampling. For all of these different tests, we can predict preferential vaporization effects. So, you know, if a fraction of a droplet evaporates, um, what does that do with the propensity of the the fuel to auto ignite, so we can uh, we can do that, um, and the the viscosity and, and density predictions for a, a reasonable range of temperature, we can do pretty well when we couple it to the VUV detector. Here's an example, Andre. If you want to go back and look at the MS spectrum, I'm happy to provide more information about this. But here, what we're doing is. Um, This is a two-dimensional chromatogram of that Virant SAK. I've had a number of faculty have talked about that, that SAF test with Virant and, and Hefa flying from Chicago to DC on 100% SAF in one engine. And so this was a blend component in that. I think it was blended at 21%. And aromatics are really important for swelling, which I have on a later slide. So here we take a two-dimensional chromatogram and we, we do the VUV detection. These two peaks come pretty darn close to co eluding but with the VUV detector, we're able to distinguish the spectra between the two. And this is just a, a movie in time between different modulations in the 2D VUV. So yeah, three, oh, three isopropyl, one methyl, three isopropyl, one methyl, four isopropyl. We're able to specify 95% of all the carbon I mass to 22 specific stereo and uh, 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 structural isomers in the sample. And so, you know, the idea being that, you know, it's not, it's not automated yet, but it's, we're marching there pretty quickly with the property predictions and uncertainty quantification and everything. Go ahead. On, on the previous slide. Yes. The top left plot shows the absorbent spectra for one methyl four and one methyl three isopropyl benzene. Yeah. Is that repeatable enough that you can really tell the difference? Those are awfully similar when I see that. Yeah, that's a great uh, a great question. So um, the the two are two of the most matching spectra. And I thought about putting in the slide and I didn't put in the uh, in the sub in the backup. Maybe I should have. <clears throat> two of the most similar spectra we've seen uh -huh. are three methyl heptane and four methyl heptane. So that's <clears throat> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's here, or no, here versus here, mm -hmm. right? And um, we get, I think it's <clears throat> two or three nines, R squared value. And what you do, you, visually you can see the difference. You, it's obvious, clear as day. But if you look at the, the distribution of the residuals of the fit, mm -hmm. you end up with a, a bimodal in the wrong fit for the distribution of those residuals. So you get a, a bump and the kurtosis is dramatically different. So, you know, just scanning on kurtosis alone, you know, with R squared, it's a pretty good, it's a, it's a very good question. It's, it's, I have a grad student 
who I don't think believed could be done what, what I asked him to do. And at this point, he's like, I can't believe the spectra lines up this well every single time. It's, 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 a, it's a really nice system. We're very lucky to have. So one of the things that we, we uh, beyond aligning various technologies to be uh, qualified, we also work on um, you know, advantage properties of SAF. So within you know, SAF overall, it's, it's a very large space. And within that space, you know, there's opportunities to increase specific energy, energy density, to reduce emissions, non-volatile particulate matter, to do all sorts of things that people want um, out of their, uh, their aviation system. And so those we call value and performance metrics. And then there's a whole bunch of other metrics that you cannot touch, right? Aviation is built around redundancy and there's only one energy source on an aircraft. So operability and safety cannot be, um, cannot be uh, uh, deleteriously hurt. So we, we, have, we spent a lot of time in terms of, uh, or we have historically spent a lot of time um, optimizing SAF compositions and developing Pareto fronts just based off, off those compositions with something called JUDO. We were talking about earlier today, uh, very selective acronyms, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm guilty of with our judo. Um, and so basically, we can take any number of, of fuel species, uh, full distillate fuels or, or individual species, it doesn't matter. We have a series of objective functions that we're changing. Um, I'll show on the next slide, uh, just specific energy versus energy density. <clears throat> but we also have engine models that are built in the judo right now, too where we look at uh, fuel compositions that can suck as much heat from an engine as possible, sensible energy, and put it into the fuel. And if you suck enough heat out of the engine, then you have opportunities to drop weight, uh, various um, uh, 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 heat transfer um, devices in the engine, the ACOC in particular. And so we're able to kick out an overall Pareto front after this optimization. Here's an example with some uncertainty quantification um, taking a little bit of a step back, what we're plotting here is specific energy versus energy density. We call this a seed plot. Um, on the corresponding X and Y axes, we have a percent difference from a nominal jet fuel. <clears throat> the various symbols represent isoalkanes and alkanes of different carbon numbers. So this is probably carbon number eight or something like that. And this is carbon number, I don't know, 16. It may be somewhere documented on the slide. This is the, the similar uh, series for cycloalkanes. This one is actually dimethylcyclooctane, which is a very interesting molecule. These are decalins, mono, um, uh, 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 cyclo, or mono aromatics, and that one is uh, methylmaplane, I think. And this is the, uh, the, the spec limit for jet A. It's a, this red line, 42.8 megajoules per kilogram. You multiply that value times the upper and lower bounds for density, you get this blue region. And uh, these points are our best average and worst case jet fuel. This contour plot is the, uh, the PQIS database. It's a database the military has maintained on uh, uh, aviation fuel properties. So, <clears throat> Um, you see kind of a distribution there. The blue line is effectively the conventional fuel Pareto front. There does not exist a conventional fuel in that database that is to the uh, right of that line. And um, this is what we're calling the high performance fuel region. We had a program that was looking at trying to push, you know, as far as we can up that, this high performance fuel region. And these are two different solutions with some uncertainty quantification. The green line is if we don't need aromatics in the fuel. The orange line is we have to maintain 8% aromatics in the fuel. I'll talk about this in a little bit, but one of the major concerns with sustainable aviation fuel is the material compatibility of SAF. SAF, uh, the, the, the most, the currently most 
commercialized processes do not have the capacity to meet the material compatibility requirements. And that being more specifically O-ring material compatibility. So right now the industry wants to maintain 8% aromatics in the fuel. And that hurts your, your specific energy because aromatics have less hydrogen. <clears throat> Even if you add long alkyl chains, do you get the same swelling if you've got, you know, let's say, you know, an ethyl benzene or a propyl benzene, <clears throat> pentyl benzene? Yeah. So, so that is a, um, I, I do have a, a little bit of a slide. It's going to be disappointing to answer your question, what I have on the slides, but yes, we're definitely looking into it. Uh, Sheffield did some work on that uh, somewhat recently. Um, and we are very interested in, <clears throat> in minimizing the, uh, the, like the TSI while maintaining material compatibility. So we're looking at a homogenous series of, of aromatics versus cycloalkanes. So, you know, toluene versus methyl cyclohexane and, and building up from there. Um, yeah, uh, the problem with material compatibility, and, and again, it's on the, we talked about it earlier today, and it's on a later slide, so I should probably just stop talking because it's redundant, but um, stereochemistry is really important. And that's really hard to predict the impact that has. So, um, so unfortunately it's test, 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 test. Well, tests take on the order of, uh, almost a month sometimes. So, and then on the, on top of that, the conditions we test at are actually aren't <clears throat> the most strict conditions to test at and the most strict conditions to test at take even longer lower temperatures. So, so you're kind of, we're in this, uh, you know, we're moving as fast as we can, building as many of these as we can, but uh, yeah. Any other questions or? Uh, because I, I don't know, are matrix, uh, have a better compatibility with materials? Yeah, so they, so aromatics, um, so when you expose a nitro rubber in particular, nitro rubber, it does, performs well at low temperatures. It's not necessarily nitro rubber is the only solution, but it's the one that they use the most right now. So nitro rubber performs low, low, good at low temperatures, but when you expose nitro rubber to aromatics, part of that uh, elasticizer or uh, uh, part of that material is solvated by the aromatic and removed from the O-ring. And then when you remove the aromatics, from the O-ring later by solvating it with, with some sap, the O-ring shrinks. <laughs> and so that's the concern is that your O-ring shrink and you leak, you leak uh, fuel. So this is kind of talking about what I said before, I'm running a little bit late on time. I've got a, a few more slides. Let me keep on going. This is regard, in regard to the, to the swelling and aromatics. Um, Andre lost the bet for those of you at the at the group meeting earlier today. He lost the bet on which which uh, decalin was going <clears> to <throat> swell better than the other one. But this is uh yeah. So so back in uh, 2011 and some early um, SAF tests, uh, I think it. I don't know which fuel caused this leak. A fuel caused a leak. Uh, that they put the fuel in the in the aircraft the night before planning on testing it. And when they came back in the morning, fuel was on the runway and they, they knew there was a problem. And so that's why this 50-50 blend limit with many of the SAFs exists because um, there's no aromatics in the fuel and that's, you know, first order, that's, that's what helps keep them swelling. So we do a lot of these tests, optical delometry, it's very simple to do. And we have like, more than a dozen of them constantly running around the clock and students constantly, you know, going in and pulling out different materials. And we're trying to heat up the test to get them moving faster, but, um, you know, it's just, it's just a very arduous, it, it, there's, people have done some theory on this years and years ago. And um, the people who did it said, don't try and do it. So um, maybe we should anyway, but, um, so what I'm showing here is, uh, is a, a range of conventional fuels. So statistically, this is uh, one sigma, two, and three sigma. 
for a conventional fuel range. In nitro rubber, <clears throat> ideally, a sap is going to land somewhere in this swelling range. Um, and we're plotting this versus aromatic content. <clears throat> this is a uh, C1. So this is an isobutanol ATJ, alcohol to jet, Annex 5. And you can see when it's exposed, the, it actually shrinks. Uh, the top one is uh, cisdecalin, swells very, very well, excellent uh, candidate. There's, there's a, a lignin pathway that swells even more. And so when you look at, you know, the valorization of lignin is a huge, huge uh, research area, you know, putting that in at some low concentrations with various pathways, I think is a big, a big opportunity. Is that material rich in phenolics then? It's, it's decalins and, and larger uh, cyclo uh, alkanes. Um, Substituted cycloalkanes or just I, you know, like triple ring cycloalkanes? Uh, triple ring uh, bicyclic, so they're, they're just joined by one carbon bond. Um, it, to be honest, uh, there's a lot of work in terms of to the analytical chemistry and what is in there, um, because there's a lot that we don't really know very well but it swelled very, very well uh, as, as a low blend component. So and ideally we're, go ahead. Yes, thank you. The, the scale bar on that one, how big is the, the hole there, the swelling, the movie? Uh, how long is this, this movie taking place? The scale bar, how big is it? The scale bar, uh, yeah, so um, this, outside ring yeah. is a uh, is a little glass cylinder that is probably about one inch in diameter maybe less than that so no no this is this yeah so here this is time in minutes and this goes out to five thousand minutes and and it, it can go even longer too so it takes a lot of time for these tests to converge um you know and we're, we're working at building somewhat physical models, you know, very simple um, models to try and predict this. But really my, my overarching, like what I wanna <laughs> try to work towards is how do we stay in this range and swelling and work down this axis right here? You know, <clears throat> we want to minimize soot and VPM and aromatics to first order is a good way to do that. So I'll, I'll end here. Um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of work in SAF to, still to be done, um, but I think there's a lot of reason, or here's a, a very good reason for, um, for optimism. Uh, I take uh, some data that other people have compiled, and I've tried to do some other announcements by myself, but this is <clears throat> global production capacity of SAF. Um, over the next several years, marching out to 2030. This is based off of announcements by oil companies, by, um, you know, SAF companies. They make an announcement about a place, a date, a pathway, and I grab that information and put it in a spreadsheet. And so you can look at these various pathways. So HEFA is the yellow. If you're flying out of LAX, <clears throat> World Energy HEFA is on your plane. Um, and there's a lot of commercialization activities going on in, in Europe and Southeast Asia. Um, but in time, it's interesting to see the growth in the alcohol, the jet pathway. This is due to GIVO and lands attack overwhelmingly. And this one is mostly uh, one company that I do trust and they haven't decided yet. And I've talked to them very recently about this, a very big oil company. Um, this is what they really wanna do. So I, I trust them. So that's why I put it on this plot. But by 2030, in terms of capacity of total world consumption, we're looking at around 7%, a little bit more. That means 93% is not SAF, but a 7% number is pretty, pretty hefty, I think, in, in, in the grand scheme of, of decarbonizing one of the hardest to decarbonize sectors uh, just by 2030. Um, but there's a lot, a lot still to be determined. So thank you very much. So a comment, I wouldn't rush it. Um, yeah. There are multiple lessons about 
how either fuel behavior or interaction with elastomers uh, is very time dependent. Um, in the biodiesel world, they couldn't figure out why in the field you were getting uh, plugging failures and gelling fuel when that fuel, if you tested it in the power plant, you would say, this fuel should not cloud at this temperature, but you put it in a truck and leave it out overnight. And uh, it's all in the game, mm -hmm. we really got at that. It was minute concentrations of sterile decoverols or some other compound. And given enough time, it would precipitate. It was, it was a kinetic thing. And it was the time exposure, as your example there of the mm -hmm. leaking aircraft kind of showed. Um, and in work that we did at Penn State, Joe Perez's student, uh, Kimberly Wayne, showed that she could get an elastomer to soak up a ton of dimethyl ether. And if you just quickly relieve the fuel pressure, the dimethyl ether, which I guess, mm -hmm. would jet out, it would basically explode the elastomer from the inside, like the alien movie. Uh, but if you allow the pressure to drop slowly over time, the DME would come back out of the pores of the elastomer, and the elastomer strength, uh, ductility, and, and shape and size was all identical to hmm. prior to exposure. Mm -hmm. So there are times when time matters. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. One hope. It's great for your comment on the role of you know, simulation and modeling. Uh, you know, when we talk about simulating spray combustion, there's huge, there's already a lot of error going into how we, how we deal with evaporation and breakup and coalescence. And now on top of that, we're throwing huge amounts of uncertainty in all the properties. Uh, so when it comes to, I guess, simulation and modeling of jet fuels, what do you think, you know, I guess, what's the state of the art and, and what's the role of, of the CFP? Yeah, we had uh, in the National Jet Fuels Combustion Program, we had some excellent CFD groups that we were fortunate to have uh, <clears throat> participate. And um, they really focused on, on LBO and lean blowout predictions. And they did so with, with two fuels, the two extreme cases. And there was progress made, but I think, you know, really focusing on the fundamentals. Um, yeah, the it, primary atomization, secondary atomization, it's really hard unless you're doing interface capturing, which you're not going to then do all this crazy thermodynamics. We, we went through a exercise that lasted probably the better part of six months to a year of just doing basically D squared in light turbulence. Yeah. And the five different groups or four different groups got quite different results in just D squared in mild turbulence. And that was that was, you know, back to the basics in my, you know, we got a we we had some good experiments from from DLR droplet experiments that we compared. So we knew kind of what to expect. But yeah, so I I think it's back to the to the basics. I think we we tried. You know, building in some screening methods with CFD, and I think there's definitely possibility, there, you know, options for that moving forward. But just like you're saying, boundary conditions matter, right? Yeah. Fuel properties matter, and uh, you're, you're, I mean, most people doing spray modeling with the grind and cargo tracking, you're using evaporation models from the '50s. You know what I mean? Um, and only, only the last four years maybe the ability to do fully interface tracking with phase change has even come online and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that that'll open some doors but it's uh yeah i, I could i just i just so, so much uncertainty and challenges that it's like you, it's basically you get any answer you want yeah <laughs> at the moment with these complex fields yeah well, well one thing i will say that it, it's it's a it's a motivation from for myself for cfd is you know, we're using, we're developing these analytical methods for pre-screening, but we know from the get-go they can help modelers and chemical process uh, uh, development. So, like, we, we I, I would love to to work with somebody on incorporating our property models, which I, I have a lot of confidence in, 
um, certainly in terms of the uncertainty quantification, but just in terms of the characterization, I think our analytical techniques are, are very good for what you want to know in terms of minimizing the uncertainty of the various properties. So, you know, everything you showed, imagine you, you can't isolate effects of, say, turbulence on what's going on because everything's just turbulent, right? Yeah. But, but just getting good, like really good density, you know, versus temperature yeah. values. And, 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 you know, volatility of like what exactly is coming off the, the droplet, you know, we, we, can, we can help with that too. So, yeah. well, we have a question from uh, the online audience. Do we have one? Anybody on the Zoom call? Please just go ahead and, and chime in. Can I ask a quick question in between? Oh, what is that? Uh, what is Cheers. That? HEFA, like I don't know what that is. So, which one? The yellow color one. What is HEFA? Yeah. Uh, it's a uh, hydro process esters and fatty acids. Okay. So it's waste cooking oil. Uh, waste cooking oil. Oh. Um, what else is it, Andre? In, in mm -hmm. diesel, it's got another name. H H H HVO. It's it's uh, yeah, uh, hydroxide vegetable oil. In the diesel fuel context, it's referred to generally as renewable diesel. In uh, the product, renewable diesel and biodiesel are what we generally consider to be biomass based diesel. Yeah. I'm driving, it, I've been driving a car for a year on it as part of a demonstration with GM. And so, is there a reason why that's the sort of like most preferred uh, fuel that's going to be adopted? Over there's plenty the of feedstock. And it's an easy process. The refiners know how to do hydrogen very easily. You take a hydro treater that would have been used to upgrade petroleum feedstocks and you dedicate it. Maybe the catalyst is a bit different. Process conditions are slightly different, but it's something that you can dedicate a refinery to. Um, Marathon has a plant in North Dakota doing this. They're converting their refinery in Martinez just to do renewable diesel to address the market pull in California yeah. for low carbon fuel. Yeah. yeah. And that there's not electric, yeah. but low carbon fuel that is part of the solution. Aviation is the only answer. Yeah. And the idea of electric planes seems kind of crazy. And hydrogen planes, as we talked about over lunch, also seems kind of crazy. This hydrogen cool. combustion, hydrogen uh, fuel cells for regional transit, I think there's a lot of, of opportunity there. Same with you know regional you know, air mobility stuff for electric, but the vast majority of emissions, SAF and, yeah. Yeah, and, and similarly, just like what Andre said, in, in Europe, there's facilities that are being um, converted for HEFA and as well as Southeast. The, those, those were like the, the easy low hanging fruit, but it's capped at, is it 11 billion gallons yeah. of combined jet and diesel worldwide HEFA? It's something around that, 11 billion total, I think, Gallons. And, 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 and Glenn Johnston, who's now with New Seed, who was with GEVO, uh, and others at the Biodiesel Technical Workshop in the fall suggested that making 20 to 30 billion gallons a year is certainly doable. You need to expand feedstock and not compete with fuel, and there are many to food, and there are many ways to do that. So that, that's purpose grown crops or? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking about waste, waste, waste oils. Oh, there's only so much waste oil. Yeah. Yeah. That that is that is true. But there are purpose-grown crops. The thing that there were, that, that Glenn Johnson is pushing now is uh, winter cover crops. We could get six billion gallons of fuel alone in the U.S. a year from winter cover crops. Yeah. Is there a question? Is it? Is it yeah. Maybe not yet. Okay. I'll ask another. Page 22 here, slide 22, you quote a report saying alternative fuel blending slightly lowers reactivity at idle, but increases the reactivity. In what way is that reactivity measured? Is that oxidative reactivity or is that biological reactivity or is that climate related reactivity, climate forcing? So I think that uh, it's from this paper that I'm not on, but uh, there's there's been some counter trends with, with with aviation uh, SAF versus conventional fuels, which is another, you know, this is kind of an outlier paper, but uh, I do like putting it up in terms of like, what is going, yep, nice meeting you. Um, that's something that needs to probably be, be ironed out because this is important for 
for contrails potentially. Um, okay, because yeah, I'd, I'd like to know since since we do soot reactivity. Yeah. Uh, in what way are they describing your activity? If you're thinking about climate forcing, that's one thing. Like Mark Jacobson at Stanford's been worried about yep. carbon in the atmosphere as a major contrib contributor. I think that's still controversial. But um, if it's oxidative reactivity, I wonder why would you care? I I, I, I apologize. I, I I cannot remember. Um, I apologize. I should take that off. I can't remember specifics. I'll look it up and find out. Thank you. <laughs> This is just shows how ignorant I am about it. But what standards does a fuel have to meet to be considered a SAF? Is it like percent carbon reduction? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, <clears throat> sustainable is uh, is used maybe a bit too liberally in some cases. Right now, the U.S. Um, government, I believe, it's a fifty percent reduction in carbon intensity. Um, that doesn't mean it can't go. Uh, zero or negative, sure. um, but I believe fifty percent is the uh, the goal. So when you're talking about a hundred, the the hundred percent or three billion gallons of SAT, you know that's a you know a, a corresponding CI reduction of about fifty percent versus conventional fuel. For the renewable diesel, nested oil from one of their pathways from from waste cooking oil, the carbon intensity of that fuel is is rated. At 16.9 grams per megajoule. So that's like fractions. Yeah. Percent yeah. Fraction or yeah. more. And long term, the biodiesel folks think that they can get the carbon intensity of US biodiesel down from its current number of 30 versus 95 for, uh -huh. for diesel fuel and probably for jet as well, down to six with green methanol and solar or renewable mm -hmm. energy for the process heating. There, there's a there's a lot of uh, companies that are you know looking at combined um, biogenic energy. We have a paper um, in Juul recently that does uh, biogenic energy and CCS and renewable energy, and you know we're able to really drive down the CI score. <clears throat> Another paper we looked at, I think it's a hundred negative one hundred sixty five percent. CI score using uh, volatile fatty acids and, and oh. uh, arrested methanogenesis. <clears throat> and the reason be being that number is so low is because of typically uh, there's methane emissions for the alternative and that counts in your CI score. So yeah, lowest I've seen or seen reported is minus 278 or dimethyl ether produced from dairy gas. And I'm not sure what dairy gas is. <laughs> Cow, about cow, cow burps <laughs> or about the cow's manure or whatever, but yeah, that's the lowest I've seen so far. All right, well, uh, thank our audience both online and uh, here in uh, in uh, EECS. Uh, any final questions from anyone who's online? All right, well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you.